I've been here many times, but not with my classmates, Dr. Alta. Um, so it gives me extra pleasure because I don't think we have been on the same dice forever. No? Once. Once, okay. Right. Right, right. Okay. Thank you. So he has also helped me by giving a bird's eye view of the entire Telephys course. So maybe I'll skip those things. Let me begin by citing an instance in which I have been delivering addresses, keynote addresses, plenary sessions on the same theme over the last uh, two decades. And one of the seminars on the same topic, probably, uh, that was in uh, SNDP Women's College. Column. On the dais was the secretary of the SNDP association, the manager, I would say. He was the son of late R. Shankar. After delivering the keynote address, he asked me a question. Doesn't say, why should you, or why should we worry about the aesthetics or the theory or perspectives? And he quote, I'm quoting from him. I read a book, a novel, and I like it. That's it. And why should we go beyond that? Normally, keynote addresses do not have an interactive session, but I beg the president to reply to his anxiety, I would say. So I just asked him, sir, if the novel that you have read questions, contradicts your perspective, what would be the result? Would you still like it or do not like it? And that was the answer. There were innumerable instances are there, but I'm not expatiating upon that. So I'm very happy to the head of the department, Dr. Eswana Sultana, who have invited me. Again, happy to be here with the novel speaker and my classmate, Dr. Asa Robert. We did our MA from St. Joseph's College in 75 to 77. Very recently. <laughs> then Dr. Ajay Shagar, of course. We were very good friends and we shared the same concerns. Dr. Habib, yeah, we also often interact. So the principal in absence here, I also thank her. Then my brothers and sisters. I gathered from the head of the department that some of you are sensitized to what we call the Dalit discourse. Uh, in uh, how much time do I have? Okay, okay. Because as you know, in an address, uh, I cannot probably touch upon everything that I would like to. And there are many speakers also, so it's not a problem for me. Uh, there are two ways of looking at these things. I have suggested uh, the title when I was asked. That was a kind of extempore suggestion. So I gave the title, Literature from the Peripheries, There is Literature Services and Construction. That is your title. And the title of my proposed lecture at that time, I thought, could be Delhi literature or literature of the marginalized theory and praxis. Of course, as the person who has already spoken has also related, Delhi literature is not only on theory, it is also has its own practice or a praxis. 
Well, after uh, accepting the invitation, as is my habit, I read a lot of my own articles and also other articles, even to the last minute I was coming over here. Then I thought I can broaden my area because as keynote address normally is supposed to suggest possible areas of research, especially for scholars. And I'm afraid many of you might not have certain authors, certain concept which I'm going to say. If you have heard, please raise your hands because I would appreciate that. Because I had the horrible experience of suggesting some others, some texts to the UGC net examination committee. We were in the UGC question paper sitting board for 20 years. Pardon me for that. <laughs> <laughs> and also for the evaluation. So, when I suggested, we are given certain instructions as to how to put questions, right? Seven questions on this area, another on this area, another on this area. So, we make 20, 25 questions and then sit together and sort it out. That's how we do it. Don't think that we are free to do whatever. No. So, I normally say, I am given the area uh, according to my specialization. That is non-canonical literature. That's my area. Even when I was a student, I was trying to do that. Well, that's why I did African American literature for my PhD, when no one thought about doing all that. Right. So, when I suggested, okay, this is an author, why don't you put a question on that? I will prepare my own questions, objectives. When the senior professors frown upon me, huh? what is this? We haven't heard about this author. Where is he? When they repeatedly express this eyebrows are circling and I said, sorry, madams and sorry, professors, we are not allowed to use computers and internet in the UGC network. But I sought permission from the secretary because I have to convince these fellows that I'm not just, you know. <laughs> so I, with their permission, I bought my computer, internet and showed them at least 100 others from Australian Aboriginal community, American First Nation community, African American community. And it was an argument like, because I won't withdraw unless and until then. And you know what they said? A professor, senior professor is almost uh, 17, probably you'd say, Emerson. Oh, we will put a double question on it. He's a very good author. Okay. I said he's a very good author, but this is also a very good author. I was trying to put a question on Robert Brofo. Anyone who have heard that name? Robert Brofo. No, you missed a present. Okay. Robert Brofo is an Austrian Aboriginal author activist whose first book in English, that is Aboriginal English, not the standard English, was published in 1962. The title of the book is The Fringe Dweller. Since we are discussing literature from the margins, probably I would suggest you to browse through it and get a copy of it and read. The Fringe Dweller. When I was given an invitation by the University of Western Australia, that too very recently, 19. 97 to present a paper my aim was to meet an Aboriginal person because I haven't I have only read about them I have also known at that time that we have people of Indian origin whether you are a tribal or a Dalit or otherwise had a genetic link between the Australian Aboriginals along with the Africans now, last week I read the genetic research proves that the Australian Aboriginals, Indian tribals and Africans, I didn't have any genetic evidence at least 30 years before. And the moment I saw him, and that was another story, I'm afraid I will take your time, but storytelling is a good idea. <laughs> and they were saying, Australian Aboriginal writers say, our aesthetics or our theory is storytelling. Our perspectives are in the deep storytelling. 
So when I had a presentation, I was trying to communicate to many Australian Aboriginal writers, you know, here is a person from India, I would like to have an interview with him. They were not ready. Why should this bloody Indian come and see us? But through my friends, Aboriginal friends whom I lucky to meet, seminar was only for two days. But my Australian friends allowed me to stay for 30 days along with their house. That was wonderful. So they helped me in communicating with this. Ultimately, I got an appointment with this man, Robert Ruffo, a national Aboriginal person. He was living in the forest along with this community, education, a person with no shirt, bearded. And that was my should I say, Eureka, to the world of Australian Aboriginal culture and literature. Then I delved deep into those things and spent my money, bought books, read, taught, included in the university syllabuses, and gradually researchers did postdoctoral research, I mean, doctoral research on those areas under my supervision. They are now retired professors. Okay. Now to our topic. So the latest uh, topic I have broadened is theorizing literature of the marginalized, which includes not only Dalits, but Australian Aboriginal writers, North American, that is America and Canada, First Nations, maybe people of Maori. Uh, maybe uh, Scandinavian Samis, maybe Japanese ethnically minority groups, Barakos they are called, Barakomi. So that's for general idea, don't worry about this. What this gentleman is going to speak, no, primary focus will be on the study, don't worry about it. But I'm giving opportunities for young scholars not to stick to the traditional path of English literary research. Even now, do you know that there are countries in the world who insist that PhD could only be done on British or American writers? <laughs> not bluffing, true. So many scholars from Iran who are now in Mysore University are crying because <laughs> They are told by the university only British and Americans. So this colonial language is to their research. Okay. So now the literature, as Asha has already told, is available in orality and literature ever since probably. But we English department students and teachers are available only when it is translated into English, at least a collection. Anyone can tell me the first English translated work on Delhi studies? I forgot it. The first anthology of Delhi like to translate into English in India. No, no, I'm just checking them. I know it. <laughs> okay, sorry. That's why I said so. You lose the second present. One more present I have. Let's see. So the first translation is named The Poisoned Bread. There is a poem also on the title, The Poisoned Bread, edited by Arjun Dangle. Arjun Dangle was a poet, is an academician, is a strong Dalit Panther activist. Now translations of individual works were available in Marathi, Hindi, Punjabi, Kannada, Oriya, Telugu, Hindi, but not in Malayalam. It's only in uh, 2020 that we are given a chance by the Oxford University Press to compile an anthology. And we all put our efforts together for two years and ultimately we could do it. Ever since, internationally also, Malayalam Telugu literature is now being discussed because of the translations available. And uh, Satyan Arano, my friend, and Sujin Taro, they have also brought out a very good collection of Delhi writing titled No Alphabet in 
site. Recently, no alphabet in sight. You have Google, no? Just write. Details you can get back to me if you want. I'll give my email ID here if you want. Still, there were resistance to increase inclusion of translated Dalit text. My own experience. I was a lecturer in uh, Calcutta University English Department. So when I suggested to include some trans, there was no English text available by written by the list. So I suggested uh, KJ Baby's Nadu Gaddiga, which is translate into English. My senior professor, whom I love and respect, Professor Arvi said, Dasan, this is not originally written in English. It's only translation. You can't include in your syllabus. But you know my type. I won't be true. <laughs> I fought for it. <laughs> and then finally, I could include so since then, English department has gradually been uh, sensitized, not automatically, because of the kind of, you know, activism that some of the people like me, of course, there were risks also in that, but we didn't bother. Uh, because I, I, I recollect what uh, Asha has been saying, which is a fact, many of the Dalit academicians, who are appointed in universities and colleges are considered inferior and openly others say oh they are here because of this abuse. this was a challenge i took up as soon as i became a teacher because that before that i was uh, working as a clerk for eight years in electricity board that's my first PhD. So when I joined Governor Notville College as a lecturer, I realized directly, indirectly, I'm here, oh, he is here only for the service, good for nothing. I decided in my mind, I'm going to disprove the myth that all the lead the respective are inferior. And the relentless and consistent work, studies and research I was appointed as professor on general merit, though I am a Dalit, in 2000 in Kanmuri University. And I continued there up to 2015. My students and scholars who also used to hear the inferiority stamp on the list, was, ah, no, 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 that's is here. He is here, yeah, we appointed as not as a reservation candidate, but he's an open category. I could also prove it again because I retired in 60. When I was 60 years old, I retired from Kanmuri University. Again, I was appointed as professor in the first Central University of Kerala. Again, on general marriage, not on reservation. And you can imagine how Herculean was the task for the Dalits to be appointed as a professor in Indian University. There are only one or two, not many, because it's a challenge. So no longer the myth exists. Still, people would love to can, I mean, entertain the myth. They can. Okay. Sorry for being uh, out of act. Now, the exclusionary nature of course in English literature is something which I wanted you to ponder over. I may not have enough time, but I believe when I and Asha did my MA, we didn't have much on Indian literature. We had a whole paper on American literature, but no mention about Native American, Native Canadian writers or afro canadian writers, right? Yes. Now you can imagine how I can do African-American literature and research on that, starting from scratch. Because I was thoroughly dissatisfied with the course I did. I was a graduate not in English. I was a graduate in economics and history. So I was, my thinking even then and now is slightly interdisciplinary. <laughs> I'm not much bothered about the imaginary skills and the stylistic narrative technology, first person, second person, third person narrative, metaphor, symbol, similes. I'm not much bothered about it. I'm more about how the writer's perspective, how his attitude to society, how is attitude to the idea of democracy, equality, and fraternity? 
reflects in his or her works. So there was not much to be appreciated, but I also got my certificate and so on. So I'm very much concerned that even today, English syllabus or literature, the whole program is still exclusionary. There may be some tokenisms. It was the case when there was no reference to women writers. You wouldn't believe. I was uh, heading the department in Kanura University, I told you, but I got a postdoctoral fellowship from UGC. Three years I can be away from the department. I, my pay will be given. I can go on research. I did research on Dayam, which Asha made reference to. Uh, I, Asha may not have seen my book in English and may have on that. I'll send you a copy. Uh, I have elaborated on the points you rightly mentioned how the uh, Aboriginal cultures have been represented, especially performance appropriated, interpolated, yes. So, these exclusions of English departments on even women voices are also. Because when I went for three years leave from the department, my next junior to the head of you know what he did? There was a compulsory paper on women's writing. When I came back after three years, women writing has disappeared. I mean, it's ironic that the border studies contained honorable, gentle women as well. <laughs> Two, three women teachers were there in the board. I wonder how they allowed this to be deleted. So what I'm saying is there's patriarchy, racism or casteism is still not only in the society but in departments, especially in English departments. You tell me if it's not there. So text which valorized European colonial dominant values and aesthetics found prominent place. Pedagogy, I don't have enough time because I have to cut short. Pedagogy is another serious thing. Even if you have a Dalit literature piece, a poetry or a fiction, I have seen many teachers teaching Dalit text, spoiling the entire spirit of it. So with the African literature also. So the perspective of the teacher which is reflected in the pedagogy is also important. Now I am skipping it because we don't have time. So teachers often endorsed dominant mainstream elite perspectives. Any disagreement, I am ready to answer. Anything I am saying can be contradicted. I am ready with that. And if that's active about it. When most of the teachers, especially in the English department, endorse mainstream, mainstream perspectives. Students hardly got chance to get familiarized with texts which reflect voices from the peripheries. Am I right? Margins, their cultures, worldviews, and not to speak about theoretical perspective. They think only European theory is there. Only Indian oblique Sanskrit aesthetic is there. I'll come to that. So voices from the periphery was excluded in the course of English literature in different countries, not only in India, UK, Canada, USA, Australia. I had the benefit to be in your Oxford University for some time. I, when I was given another postdoctoral fellowship to be in America and Canada, I saved some money and spent some weeks in UK, Oxford University. So there, one of my friends is a Welsh English man. When we had discussions, he said, no, English literature syllabus here do not have Welsh or Scottish piece of literature. And he presented me a wonderful volume which contains Welsh poetry. Because we can say Seamus Eni is there. That's a late entrance, latecomer. Anyway, so this exclusion of the voices of the marginalized is not only in India. It's in US, UK, Canada, Australia. These are the only countries which I am familiar. Yeah, even in Africa. But even Africa is better because their position is slightly different. So early inclusions were books written by mainstream writers. Yes, we study Anand. Right? 
because non dalit writers writing about dalit as has already been pointed out as a patronizing condescending right a constructed image of inferiority that has been swallowed endorsed by students as well so it's almost like colonizing their minds just as we find the colonial literature texts have constructed the images of the colonized as inferior based on their assumptions there i reiterate assumptions they were not true they were not verifiable assumption you assume that you are you are a dalit you are good for nothing okay right so assumptions and cultural prejudices but they won't accept that they are prejudices right and created stereotypes negative derogatory and construction of the idea of the noble savage we know crusoe so indian mainstream literature also were full of distorted historically inaccurate representation of dalit tribals and minorities now we focus on writing back from the mart i'll give you a few instances writing back we are familiar with this terminology since uh, 1960s from post colonialism but it has started even before that even in 1920s african american writers african american activists what you call black black renaissance african american renaissance 1920 we have the second renaissance 1950s it is they who propounded the idea of writing back they theorize they bring up their own concepts because i did that african american research maybe i was familiar with that otherwise i wouldn't even know about it even in 19th century i'm not going to read the text and the others you can understand it browse it through so african american literary theory if you want me to suggest a certain books i can very fast african american literary theory a reader here's a book you can understand another theorist of african american background is houston a baker junior houston a baker junior you can browse and get details another equally prominent african american theorist is henry louis gates junior still another one is addison gale who coined the term black aesthetics and my own other clearer terms so the elite discourse in india owes much to the african american discourse that's why i have referred to otherwise why should i even the whole movement the elite social political cultural movement and literary movement is almost a ditto of african american social political literary movement how was it possible because one or two academics from maharashtra had the chance to go and study in america it's their experience that forced them they were activists as well to try out similar because there is racism here it is caste So as a result of that the lit discourse in india has a parallel or as a model in african so instead of uh, african american movement we have dalit movement cultural movement social movement literary movement even the theoretical aesthetic background also more or less the same so black african american literary renaissance black power movement dalit power movement black aesthetics Delhi aesthetics mention has already been made by my friend who wrote this on Nimbalaji. Now, influence of Delhi socio-political literary movement ideology and aesthetics on Indian academia. Indian literatures and Delhi literatures. Just one or two points about the difference. It is part of Indian literature. but there is nothing called indian literature 
we would call indian literatures even dalit literatures because it has its own different uh, differences anyway the theme of caste discrimination and touchability is also expressed by non dalit writers but the perspectives differ that's why your teacher has already mentioned the importance of experience i'll come to that i'll refer to gobal guru sundar sir ek debate also wait you have premchand godan you have mulkaraj anand you have even arindhati rao and amitabh ghosh discussing these issues but the perspective is different if i write a novel i will never write but i am writing my memoir which is could be a novel also so so these writers write about the experience of the would be the list of course in literary theory we have the what you call poetic imagination you know you can imagine yourself to be you can put yourself into the shoes of others but the little critics ask the question only a person who wear the new shoe will know its bite the other person cannot know <laughs> you understand so that is what is called the life experience the real lived experience so that's a major difference sympathetic portrayals as victims unable to resist negative stereotypical similar to the representation of african americans in american literature first nations literature canada or aboriginals in australia now the construction of the image of the other in literature for you to ponder over no time to expand it up how dalits are represented in indian early indian literature just suggestions no time to expand it up you can explore why so questions as i have already given you permission to ask questions only not to answer <laughs> So I'm throwing open these questions. Why Dalits are represented in early literature as stereotypical? The dominant discourse, the Hindu Brahminic ideology, what you call Indian aesthetic, is not Indian aesthetic. What is the other name? Sanskrit aesthetics. Have you ever heard about any other aesthetic other than? Sanskrit aesthetics, nobody. Dravidian aesthetics, Sangam aesthetics, Agam poems, Puram poems, Agana Nur, Purana Nur. Any idea? Cinema peri dekho pala kya kya nala nala. Dalkapiyam. Dalkapiyam was the earliest language and grammar text in South India. which speaks of their quality literary quality or literariness of a text in relation to the jose cultural space in which it was produced which they call tinays you know then ana therima theriyadu apra vesla okay so tolkapiyam is a tamil grammatical language text which is the earliest dravidian aesthetical text i would say or speaks about aesthetics aga meaning what is inside poems about love romance courtship etc etc puram poems are about heroism war etc etc so they are poetic just like a total poetic you know are total poetics i was a very good student of a total poetics <laughs> I studied by heart the whole definition of a trope. Even now I can, but I never knew about Sangam aesthetics or Dravidian aesthetics or Agam poetics or Puram poetics. I never heard about Tulkapi. So there are five tenets: cultural, social spaces. Anyone? Any idea? Okay. Kurinji, the basic mood, 
of the text produced in this area is sexual union. Mulai, the basic mood is yearning. Marudam, the basic mood is sulking like us. And neither pining, palai separation. How wonderful it is. The basic text produced naturally has a relation to the kind of people live there, the society, the flora, the fauna, the trees, isn't it? And that's how they developed their politics. When it was that? It was in around 3rd century AD, up to 3rd century, 4th century. But unfortunately, we literature students only know Sanskrit aesthetics, which is marketed as Indian aesthetics. So the natural and local and the move. Tolkapya's literary theory unfortunately do not find space in English departments or English centers. I made an attempt maybe 10 years before. Ah, that's in video, no Tamil. Because basic texts are in Tamil, no translations are available. Madhra Nayakam is a former English professor. He has written a small book introducing these concepts into. But I don't know your library has a book. No. It's out of print now, but you get a text. See, the Tolkapya's literary theory identified three forms of just as Nati Shastra or just as Sanskrit aesthetics tell you the whole aim of life is four things. What is it? Dharma, Artha, Kama, Mosha. They will not come Oshan Lepitkanam. But Dravidian aesthetic do not have the fourth component because they don't believe in soul at all. I don't believe in soul. I don't believe in God. Because I am, they are my precursors. They may. I follow this Shramanic tradition, Shramanic theory, the Buddhist, Jainist Shramanic theory, where we don't believe in our principle is, as Buddha said, Anicca. That's a Pali word. A N I C C A. No gold, sorry, I cannot write. Anicca. A N I C C A. Anicca meaning impermanent. Everything in this world is impermanent. Am I right? Okay. And the second important concept is Anitya. There is nothing immortal. Everything is mortal. Okay, anitya, and that is dukkha. Dukkha doesn't mean sorrow, it only means unsatisfactoriness. These are the cardinal principles, these are the Dhamma based on which the Buddhist, the Dravidian aesthetics developed. And that's a major difference between Sanskrit aesthetics and Dravidian aesthetics or Tamil aesthetics. That's a major difference. Nati Shastra, Bharata Muni, etc, etc. So in short, I am just cutting short because we, we can't take much time. So the total absence of the fourth objective that is Mocha is significant because it gives you the idea that South India was a place, a local where they had a strong influence of Buddhist philosophy, Buddhism, Jainism, Samana believes at least up to 8 to 10 centuries. Probably my friend Ajay Sagar will expatiate upon that. Buddhist influence in South India and like Tulkapya, his name is not known, so we call only Tulkapya. He could be either a Jain or a Buddha. Anyway, but it's not a Hindu Brahmin, definitely yes. So they proclaim, they, we focus on rationality. That is where we find the link with Ambedkar. I am a rationalist. I don't believe whatever is irrational. That's why I don't believe in no God. My rationality does not approve the existence of a person is omniscient who can control everything. Whether I should pass my MA, whether I should get a PhD or I could get an appointment. It is not the God who decides. It's me who decides. Isn't it? Yeah. So, instead, the Dravidians of the Sramanas or Buddhists focused on, what is it, 
Sheila. What is Sheila? It's not the cloth that you wear. Sheila again is Pali word. Sheila. The practice, your behavior. What is your behavior? Go to the classes only late. <laughs> Go as early as possible. But the sila that we try to practice is not to kill, not to tell lies, not to use intoxicated drinks, neither to smoke, to consider every living being on earth as equal, and to do whatever dana you could. Dana. Right? Your, your sakat kind of thing. And the most important thing, just like sila, is panna. All these are Pali words because Buddha originally wrote or Buddhist teachings were wrote originally in Pali only. Buddha was asked by his close uh, disciple Ananda, Sir, can we write it in uh, Sanskrit? Hey, never. If you write it in Sanskrit, then it will not be yours as it happened with the Vedas and Upanishads. So that's why Buddha insisted that Buddhist teachings should be recorded only in Pali, which is the most common language used by ordinary people. That's why Pali. Panna meaning wisdom, knowledge. Knowledge is not PhD. It's a rational knowledge. Because people like us may say, I have a double PhD. But you can be a fool. Unless and until you are using this knowledge, your awareness for the betterment of society, then you are a fool. Just like Shakespeare and fools. There are fools who are real fools but pretend to be wise and the vice versa ours. Right? Like the stone and things like that. So now I am broadening up again. So Dalit literature, African American literature, now to the other literatures, what we call fourth world literatures and fourth world theory. I know that it is strange to you. It was strange when I spoke about it 20 years before in Mysore University, Bangalore University, so much so that participants ridiculed me. Oh, what are you saying, sir? Third world, fourth world. Now, when is the fifth world, sixth world? We were ridiculed because when we cut across these ideas to scholars and academic staff colleges. But their ignorance cannot be pardoned. Now you have book on fourth world theory. You want me to mention? Yes. <laughs> okay, you can even Google it. Anyway, I'll tell you one. The idea of fourth world literature was first mentioned in international scenario along with the World Council of Indigenous Peoples in the UN. That is in 1972. World Council of indigenous people. There was a conference, 1972. What, is, what does it mean, fourth world literature? You should ask me. What is fourth world literature? Literature or written work of native indigenous people <coughs> living in a land that has been taken over by non natives. Right? Agreed? So we are also fourth world citizens. Our literature is fourth world literature. And we should theorize from this perspective. That's why fourth world theory. Text you want? Right. Note down. This concept, George Manuel, George Manuel and Michael Koslund. These are the two first nation Canadian academics and theorists and activists who proposed this idea. They suggested this idea for a political unification of the indigenous peoples across the globe. So that is how it came. Now some of the people like us who are interested in listening to the other voices have made some explorations. We published articles on it, etc. etc. If you want me to mention at least two, three others on this category, yes or no? Yes. So, Arnold Krupa, that is from Canada. Arnold Krupa, 
I wish I had a oh, bro. It's okay. Then Thomas King. Thomas King. Then Gerard Wisner. If you know the names, you can Google, right? Gerard Wisner. Then Craig Buma. Wonderful book. Craig Buma was in Mumbai. I had the opportunity to meet him. And he had only one copy of his book, Red on Red. Red meaning Red Indians. Red on Red. Red Indians speaking about themselves, not the white men speaking about themselves. Though he had only one copy, ah, my gift to the gap, he gave me his copy. So I have this precious copy even now. Red on Red. So Michael Postlands, you refer. Fourth World and Indian Reality. There's an article which is already available on net. Okay. Can I go? Only, only standing where I started. Okay. Uh, the lit discourse, theory, and aesthetics is an alternative or counter cultural discourse, as the, those academics who have theorized or imagined about this seminar already, I, I believe that they share this perspective. It's an alternative discourse, it's a counter cultural discourse. We have edited a volume called Counter Cultural Discourse. A discourse of resistance is not easy to resist. Literary theory and criticism. What is theory approach? What is theory? Agree, agree or disagree with me after I read what is theory. It's a common definition. It's not very, very bombast. Theory provides the tools or frameworks for understanding, interpreting literature. Okay? Common definition. So, literary theory is the practice of theoretical, methodological, and sociological reflection that accompanies reading and interpretation of literature. Agree? If there's any disagreement, please listen. It investigates the conceptual foundations of textual scholarship, the dynamics of textuality, the relations between literature and other arts, what we call intertextuality. Okay? And what is criticism? And how is criticism different from theory? No time to expect it, but one word or one sentence. Criticism applies these tools, the tools provided by the theoreticians, to analyze, evaluate. That's what you do in research. Agree? Research scholars, mind you, this is your job. To use the tools, either post-structuralism, structuralism, modernism, deconstruction, intersectionality, feminism, pure theory, whatever. To use the tools, because those tools have been, or these ideas have been propounded in a society where it is very different from ours, isn't it? So instead of blindly, mechanically applying these theories, Try to digest them. It's not really easy. You have to have a medicine also. <laughs> Allopathy also. Just to digest it. Because it's not uh, our uh, social, cultural makeup thing. I know many of my students. <laughs> it's a secret. Don't tell anyone. Yesterday I had a call from uh, another scholar who did a PhD. It was rejected. I have rejected a thesis last week. Don't blame me. We, we are forced to because we expect a minimum uh, level standard. Otherwise, uh, we can't. You know, so, we so, this candidate's uh, thesis has been rejected. Uh, she is asked to revise. What is the suggestion given by the examiner? Use theoretical tools in interpreting. She called me, sir. I don't know theory, so what should I do? For your resubmission, you are given maximum six months or one year. So I suggested a shortcut. Meet someone who know a little bit of theory. Sit with them. Pay them if they want. Because I accept payments for PhD consultation. Yes. Because it's a very challenging job. Right now one is done already. And sit with them. Visit libraries. Then she said, sorry sir, I don't have money. I said, that I can help. So I promise that. 
that's yesterday. I hope she will spend some time with the university teachers and then do it. So this is the problem. Theory is there, but we don't have the competence, I would say, to use these tools in an appropriate way, in a socially meaningful way, or in a way which is relevant to our topic. That's the problem. You can use any quotings from any theoreticians here and there. No, this is what we did in those days. Now you can't do that. <laughs> here and there, some quotings refurbishing. Okay, so why theory is important? You should have asked me. Anyway, different ways of interpreting of us interesting and exciting new perspective. That's why I was doing on African American because I want to try and understand how does the African Americans look at literature. It's not the American literature or other I studied. Okay. And that helps to generate new ideas. I wonder how many PhDs contribute to generating new ideas. In fact, research scholars are expected to contribute to, I quote from UGC, to the existing body of knowledge. Am I right? How many of us have contributed to the existing body of knowledge? People like us can say at least we have introduced some other perspectives, some other theoretical tools, some other authors. So you have number of theoretical tools, formalism, nutritionism, structuralism, historicism, Marxism. I'll only focus on two, three things in order to differentiate between the discourse, right? When it comes culture studies, etc., etc., most of the Indian academics try to look at from the other's perspective through the lens of subaltern theory. Am I right? The subaltern theories was introduced to Indian academics, of course, in Kerala or in India. And that is the only way, perspective from which we looked at Delhi studies. But now, later we realize that there is a problem. The problem is, subalternity is a Marxian, Gramscian concept in which caste is ignored. Only class is considered. Because we read Ambedkar, we know that in Indian society, caste is class and class is caste. As the Marxist said, it's not only a division of laborers, but it's a division of laborers as a better purpose. So, there lies the rub. That's the difference. People like Ranjit Guha wrote, The subordination and subjection that marks the life of Dalits in India bring them into the contours of a particularly contextual assembly of subaltern. So, the list has been appropriated by the subordinates. Because the Marxian discourse, near and Gandhian discourse, or even nationalist discourse, do not accept caste. For want of time, I am just skipping. Now, the second avatar is post colonial theory. Which also has its limited. Who is the real post colonial? Is the Adivasis of Dalits or the upper caste and Dalits? Ambani is also post colonial, isn't it? Tata is also post colonial, right? Janu is also post colonial. So you see the difference. You have a number like term in which you say all of us are post colonial. So post colonial rubric do not accept the specific subjectivity. And that's why we are not happy with it. I do have written many, I have given many lectures and also published on limitations of post-colonial theory. Post-colonial theory and challenge of caste is a good article I suggest you to read. What is the title? Post-colonial theory and the challenge of caste. Paul Obi Chakravarti is published in the International Journal of Post-colonial Studies in 2023. That's why I suggest you. Paulomir Chakravarti, International Journal of Post-Colonial Studies, 2023. 
So I am asking you, I don't have time to explain, but I am asking the question, who is the real post-colonial? The Adivasis of Delhi's or the Paka Brahmin or upper caste businessmen in India, they are also post-colonial. Now deconstruction, European invested theories, difference, I am skipping. Here lies the significance of Ambedkar's contribution to theorizing Indian society. No scholar before him have theorized the unique idea of caste. There is no country in the world where caste is there. So how can you apply the tools to a society which is unique? So that's why Ambedkar spent a lot of time, even his whole lifetime for studying Indian society and coming his he has degrees in anthropology, economics, law. So such a proliferally educated activist. That is how Ambedkar, ideology and religious ideology are related. It is more or less the same. Now, Delhi aesthetics. You have Saran Kumar in Nepal's book already, right? So I'm skipping that. He's my friend. He, I thought he would be here. I also communicated the message to him. Ah, Professor Dasan, I would come, but we don't have money to invite him. That's why. Otherwise, you would have been here. Okay. Ah, that's okay, but even then, probably he could have come, but then we already have yeah. Anyway, next time he will be here. He will be happy. Uh, so, driven aesthetics, I already told you. I have uh, noted down certain stuffs which from my own articles, but I am not reading because we don't have time. So there is a paradigm shift in the lit aesthetics because we have already been introduced to Indian public Sanskrit aesthetics. So the lit aesthetics, after as I said, is a counter cultural thing. I am. Let me read a few sentences from my own article, which is published <coughs> long back, about the theory, so that it's easy for me to save my time. Otherwise, I'll be taking much of your time. <coughs> Characteristics of now the question I will also raise you: Can any literature be Dalit literature only because it's written by a Dalit? You answer me. Should I repeat the question? Can any literature be called Dalit literature simply because it's written by a Dalit? No, that is the problem. Though early Dalit uh, uh, leaders, literary writers would like to define Dalit literature as literature written by, for, and of the parody Abraham Lincoln's definition. But as academics, we cannot approve that kind of position now. So the perspective matters. So the lit aesthetics is just one or two, three points. Whereas dominant literary aesthetics position stresses stylistic excellence. You know the Rasa theory, the Bhava, the Vakropti, right? The concept Shivam, Sundaram, right? Uh, Manu, right? Okay, so that is the kind of work of art and its ability to impart pleasure or maybe teaching. The lit aesthetics, like African, African American, Native, and Aboriginal aesthetic, is functional. Then you might ask me, Marxist literature is also functional? Yes, but they also differ. Marxist progressive literature also emphasizes the functionality of literature, but the ideological vantage point from which they evaluate literary product is the theory of class struggle and not caste struggle. So the Dalit aesthetic is to be a corrective means of helping Dalit people. That is why the functionality. Unless and until your poetry, your drama, your novel helps the people to resist the hegemony, to resist the hierarchy, to resist oppression or suppression, to resist human rights denial. What is the purpose of the literature? 
you might tell me, no, no, no. New criticism says, no, you just value the literature, forget about everything else. That's a different story. So it is the aesthetic and spiritual sister of the power movement, black power movement. And it envisions an art that speaks directly to the people. It aims at a radical reordering. This is very important. Dalit aesthetics, Dalit theory, Dalit literature aims at a radical reordering, it's not a compromise. Radical reordering of the Brahminic Hindu dominant cultural aesthetics, which is very, very challenging, which is very, very herculean. First of all, you have to know what is uh, Sanskrit aesthetics and the other side of the story, and then to look at it and to talk. It proposes a separate symbolism, a separate mythology, a separate critique, a separate iconology. That's why it is different. The second characteristic I would highlight here is Dalit literature is a validation of Dalit culture, just as feminist theory is a validation of the specific lived experience of women. Am I right? Just like that, you have a lot of similarities with uh, Delft literature and uh, uh, feminism. Of course, there are problems within feminism as well. All Indians are my sisters. No. There is an Adivasi, Adivasi sister, there is a Dalit sister, there is a Muslim sister, there is a Brahmin sister, there is a Nayar sister, there is a Priya sister. Right? So, Delft literature is a validation of Delft culture in opposition to Hindu hegemonic culture. It rebels against the assumptions of Hindu ideologies and rejects attitudes of the behavior of Hinduism. What is the behavior of Hinduism? As Ambedkar argues out in his essay, Annihilation of Caste, anybody has seen or heard about this? Annihilation of Caste? You know how unpopular I became by teaching that in my university. Students who I believe otherwise loved me, did not talk to me for three months. And I started teaching philosophy, Hinduism, and any lesson. After six months, when the course is over, hesitatingly they approached me in my chamber. Especially one Muslim girl, she is now a lecturer doing her PhD, even now keep close to me. Sir, I am confused. All this life I will learn from my society, my family, from the Islamic scriptures. Now you have made me to question these things. I said, Baba, the only work I can do is to make you confused. It is you who have to take the role. You understand what I am saying? So people ask me, why Dasan is creating division in the society? He is talking about caste in the classroom. We Keralites are very notorious for not addressing any issue which is serious, right? We don't discuss sex in the classroom. We don't discuss caste in the classroom, right? We are hypocrites, including me, right? Agree, please agree, don't worry about it. We are hypocrites, <laughs> right? So, next point, third point. The values, philosophy, and teachings of Ambedkar form the key source of ideological, theoretical positions of it. This is the answer to the question I asked just before. Just because a text is written by a Dalit, it need not be considered as, unless and until Ambedkar's ideological position is the background or the perspective from which it is a term. I am born a Dalit. There are thousands and lakhs of Dalits, but many of them are Hindus and Brahmins in their practice. I didn't observe any rituals in my life since I was 14. My marriage, no priest, no Thali, just an exchange of bouquets. Never in my life. That is another uh, one dozen is here. But there are many other dozens who, even my own colleagues in the university department, who solemnize the marriage of their sons and daughters, 
is the highest priest on the stage. I just walked out on the stage because I couldn't tolerate the ignorance, the stupidity of my colleague professor. He is an Hindi professor. So this is why I said the difference. Bone there is different. Your stand is different. It's, it's not easy. It's not easy to practice. That's why I put practice also. It's not theory. It's easy for me to talk on Dalit theory. But people who know me might ask me, the gentleman is speaking a lot about things. What about his life? Does he practice it? You understand what I'm saying? So if that is there, then only you can say he's a Dalit or he's a practice. And my own Dalit friends are not happy with me because I expose them. Every day they go to the church or they go to the temple. Are they Raman or Sita or Leshmanan or Babalan or whoever is? They worship and do all the rituals and come back and say, Baba Sabji, what is it? I have liberated myself. Baba Sahib burned the Manus Smriti because, not because he personally disliked it, but because he said these texts, the ideas of these texts will ruin. Not only India, but the world. Have any of you, my dear sisters, had an occasion to read at least a few pages of Manuskriti? That is why you are simply sitting and listening to me as if you are seeing a film. You read it. Then only I can see the, the, the passion in your, on your face. Yeah, I have read it, sir. I am not happy with that. I am unhappy. My MA students, all of them read in my arm because I get copies and give it to them free. Because I am teaching feminism. It's a very small book. I am teaching the Chiriya book. I am not sure. 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 Many of my students borrow books from me. They don't take it to home. To the hostel. Read it and without anybody saying, give it back to me. Because people believe that this might provoke the students. As I said, I was very notorious in that way. Provoking students and asking them to think in different ways, challenge me. Right? That's how I enjoy teacher's life. Right? So, next point, I will conclude with one more point. Okay. Okay. It rejects the degraded Hindu social sector. It's not I who said, Ambedkar said, said most degraded social setup is Indian society. Hierarchical, polluted. Punya Pama, Organalo, and the waiter, Savira Portal, and the Boric Poet. Polluted Pavam Punyam. These are the concepts which have indoctrinated in us. According to Brahmin, I am now doing Pavam. You know, the Parambadla, you know, the Kyanical Parin. You can't touch. Untouchable. I have experienced it. I used to participate in uh, international or national conferences in North India as well. So in one of the conferences, one of the fellow came and embraced me. And after the one hour, two hour, he is not uh, coming to me or he is not laughing at me. He is not smiling at me. I didn't know why. Later I realized by embracing, you can know whether he has a threat or not, whether he is a Brahmin or not. So he realized that I am not a Brahmin and he doesn't like to touch me or talk to me. This is from real experience. You understand? And that's true, English professors from Delhi. Are they colonial or post colonial? <laughs> okay, but they might be teaching post coloniality as well. But that's the that's the irony of it. Anyway, one more point. Dalit aesthetics or Dalit theory proclaims solidarity with and supports the struggle of all marginalized groups. They are fighting not only for Dalits. Ambedkar fought for the minority, the Muslims, better than even Jinnah. You read history and tell me if he has not. Why did he do that? Because he is a Delhi. He is not only for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. 
the minority is for the women. Gandhi never fought for women. In Sambedkar who fought for women. That's why he said you read a little bit of history also, along with English literature, because we are living in India. So the aesthetics of theory proclaims the solidarity with the supports and struggle of all marginalized groups, tribals, landless peasants, women, minorities, even environmentalists. Okay, I'll go like this. So uh, any writing with the characters listed above can be described as a literature. Now let me wind up. Otherwise, I'll go on and you don't have some time for other sessions. Now, one more question. Do those with no living experience have the right to theorize? Coming back to what your teacher said. Yes, because I'm a writer. I have the freedom to write about whatever. You can't deny that. So it says yes and no. It's up to you to take position. Okay. The cracked mirror, have you heard that? You don't love to look at a cracked mirror, right? Cracked Mirror is a book containing articles on the serious debate between Sundar Sarukar, he is a physicist turned philosopher, plus and Gopal Guru is a political scientist in front there. Have you heard about these names? Uh, EPW has published an article by Gopal Guru who said, among the socialists of India, it was never said before, no? Individual youth experience has to be taken into consideration while you theorize. So theorizing experience, and that is where what I call African American literature, first generation Canadian literature, Russian African literature, women literature, tribal literature, even women writing could be theorized. You have again articles, a recent article I have seen, From Colonial Irony to Dalit Truth, A Perspective on Experience by Rajitro. I leave it that. You have another article again, Dalit Life Writing Testimony on Human Rights by Paramut Kenair, you know, in area. So, I'll quote before I end from Arjun Dangle, who is the editor of the book I mentioned. I quote, Dalit is not a caste but a realization and is related to experience, joy, sorrows and struggles of those in the lowest strata of society. Let me continue. The significance of the seminar, I'm sure, with serious academic discussions related to the literature from the periphery, the experience of the marginalized and the attempts to theorize them will sharpen the minds of the scholars students bearing witness to the seminar and the talks here and probably help them to be free from the prejudices, bias, consciously or unconsciously internalized. Thank you very much. Yes.